we never know where our career or the decision we make is going to take us. But if you align yourself with the right people at whatever time it is, but just the right people, the opportunities create themselves. Designed to encourage, empower, and educate real estate professionals by sharing best practices from business leaders that are proven winners. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati, and this is Calibrate Real Estate. Broadcasting from the Rocky Mountains, this is the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati, and our special guest today is Vanessa Bergmark from Red Oak Realty. Welcome, Vanessa. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Good stuff. Well, for those of you who are frequent podcast subscribers, you will notice a couple things. First of all, we're not broadcasting from the Mile High City. We're broadcasting from Grand Lake, Colorado at 8,369 feet above sea level. I'm on vacation. Vanessa was kind enough to make this all work. Our schedules were pretty tricky to, to get uh, synced up. So Vanessa, thanks again for being with us today. And we're going to talk a lot about what it's like to be a CEO of a company that is moving and making a lot of things happen in Northern California. So Red Oak Realty, from what I'm familiar with it, is a company that's been around for decades. They're based in Oakland and Berkeley. Vanessa became the CEO in 2009 when she bought the company from the founders or the former owners. She actually started there in 2007. So real quickly here, Vanessa, let's talk about that transition of coming to Red Oak. I know you were in management at a different firm. You were managing then an office. And then what was that like to actually transition into the ownership role? Well, you know, the, the interesting part was I was, I was at a company, I started my career just very quickly as a sales agent. Um, I sold for 14 months before I went into management. And um, somebody said earlier, I was talking about that, and they said, you can call that a career. And I was like, well, <laughs> it was the beginning of a, of a different career, but I started as a sales agent. I got in for the flexibility. I bought my first house. I loved the experience. And I thought I could do this. And, um, and I got in and I loved it. But I went into the angle where I would, someone would write an offer on my property and I would say, hey, can I help you package that and style it a different way? And how do you have done this? this might and then I started getting into more training and coaching and realized that I wasn't, that wasn't my job and I wasn't getting paid to do that. But that was what I loved about the business is, is building it myself, but then actually seeing it be built around me with other agents. So I was offered a role in management soon after. So 14 months I sold and that's it. I've been in the business going on 16 years and I only sold for a very short time. But my heart is in the transaction and my heart is with the, where, the con, where the consumer is with the agent. So fast forward, I was a manager there. I was actually a manager at a, uh, what they call a team leader at a, at a Keller Williams office here in Oakland, right about two years after it was launching. And I managed 165 agents and I loved the agents I was with. And I really, I did actually really appreciate the brand but I um, had adopted a young child and I wanted to kind of get this more work-life balance piece. And when I was on maternity leave, the phone started to ring with potential other offers for other companies. Red Oak had always been around and it was a very small, um, independent, uh, a great size boutique. And I took a couple of conversations with a different group of people, but I took one with Red Oak, just going in there, just being open-minded. I wasn't planning on really switching my career. And I instantly, instantly had a values alignment with the four founders that had founded it 40 years before. And I walked out saying, I think, I think I'm going to do this. Like, I think I'm going to leave this company, which has this big platform and is growing at this fast rate. And I'm going to go and I'm going to do this business with these four people. And I made the decision relatively quickly. And I went over there. Um, and, and there's often this conversation of like, wow, it was not a step down because it was a fabulous company, but it was a smaller company. There wasn't this like big idea of room for growth. And, and it, the weird thing was, it was never about that. It was just about this synergy and how I saw that they had run a company for 40 years. And I saw that my values and what I wanted to do was very much aligned with that. So I took the job. I went from 160 agents, I think, to managing 25 at their office right around the corner from the office I just left. And I built new relationships with agents that I did not know. And I did that for about, about two years before I moved into the general manager role and then ultimately purchased the company. 
but as far as what it was the transition, I think it's, you know, we never know where our career or the decision we make is going to take us. But if you align yourself with the right people at whatever time it is, but just the right people, the opportunities create themselves. And I think that's what happened. I, I met with many other people that had many different other offers during that time when I was on leave. And I went in the way with the right group of people. And I'll tell you, doing that, I, I haven't had to look back because it was clearly the right decision, although I didn't even necessarily know that at the time. Gosh, that's a really cool story. And I think the tendency for a lot of people is to think that bigger is better or busier is better. And I think in a lot of the interviews that I've heard you speak, you talk about this, and I think that work-life balance is a concept that a lot of people talk about right now, but, but you talk about quality over quantity quite a bit. And there's, there's a lot in that. There's a lot in Red Oak that you talk about, look, we're, we're not constantly focused in on how can we hire more agents, some of the, some of the other companies that you compete with and then companies that you've been with in the past um, may focus more on numbers, agent count, transaction count. And I think it's really important to have this concept that look boutique and independent and finding a lifestyle that fits your work and your, your home life, they all fit and they're congruent, I think is really, really important. So I think that we're going to have a really fun time talking about all of that. We touched right at the big beginning of the fact that you are the owner and CEO of Red Oak. So women-owned businesses, I, I think they're getting, apropos, they're getting a lot of attention right now. One of my favorite books that I've read time and time again, both the actual hard copy as well as the audible version, is Christy Wright's Business Boutique. And the subtitle of that book is A Women's Guide for Making Money doing what she loves. It's also a great listen if you like podcasts. She does a podcast and the original podcast was uh, designed to launch her book, but she's continued on with it as a lot of authors do. Several trends were recently noticed, noted in this article that I read by the U.S. Department of Labor, specifically their Women's Bureau at the U.S. Department of Labor. And one of the things I found was really interesting is that women own close to 10 million businesses, accounting for 1.4 trillion in receipts yet only 27% of chief executives are women. So how does that make you feel as a CEO? I mean, obviously that's something you've aspired to do, something that you willingly stepped into. But I, I think we're in this really interesting time right now in business where there's a lot of focus in on like, we wanna make sure that there's a quality on all levels, regardless of gender or, or other things. And I think real estate does a very good job of making sure that we're um, focused on non-discrimination as it relates to home ownership and things of that sort. So as, as a CEO, and, and I will focus in on the female aspect of it, how does that particularly make you feel that still only 27% of chief executives are women? Well, I mean, I guess it could off the top, my first initial response to that is, I wouldn't even say it's sadness because I think it's going to change. I mean, I think that the way society is moving and the value of what a woman has brought into the home and the economy, that that perception is changing, right? As to, I, I always believe that you you can have it all, but you can't all have it all at once, right? There's that 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 concept of a lot of times we've been we've had to make a decision between family and work, and that is not something that many women take lightly, right? And there has to be, you have to put a plan in place if you are both going to raise a family, run a household, and then run a business at the same time. And there hasn't been a lot of opportunity to do that both. And as nurturers, I think we've often chosen that the family will come first. And I think, I think that that still is a very valid point and will always remain. What I think we're starting to realize now, and I believe technology does have a big play in this, is that you can do this job and you can set standards that don't make you have to sacrifice running that family if you have those standards. If you say, I'm going to give it all up for the business and I have to give this away, then you will and you won't be able to do both and you'll be probably pretty disappointed. But I think technology has given us that opportunity in which we can connect, right? We're, you're, you're, you're in Colorado. I'm in California and we're having a conversation and it's going to be broadcast out on a platform that didn't exist 10 years ago, right? 20 years ago. So this is giving us an opportunity to be able to do maybe not two things at once, 
but not necessarily be attached to a desk or drive down to a corporate office far, far away, and then also be able to make it home in time to get your kids, right? Or be able to order dinner and make sure and check books and do all those things. So that, that there's an opportunity there now that just simply did not exist that give women an opportunity that we didn't have before because it had to be one or the other. You simply couldn't be in both places at both times, but now you can. A lot of the women, I have, I have a company right now where it's 15 employees. Now, we're 100 agents, we're 15 employees, um, but we do a lot of work. We move very quickly. We have a lot of product. We closed almost a thousand homes last year. We did almost 900 million in production. We're not like us, you know, we're not like, oh, we're just a boutique, we only do, no, we do a lot of business. But we also are mothers, our, our kids get sick, um, you know, someone doesn't show up for school one day or we have to go home, we have to do that. So what I've been able to do as a female owner is look at my staff base and say, do you really need to get in a car today to come to work or can we do a lot of this on a platform and you can do it just as well? And you do not feel compromised to do that job. And I think that that first has to exist in the structure and the efficiencies of the company right outside of the CEO but why you're seeing more women move to the top is because they were given that opportunity when they were working within the company to move to the top right they don't just get plopped in from the beginning and say like here you're gonna run the company a lot of them have to go level up through the company and they have to be able to do the work and also run the family side by side until they grow into that career and it's the first time that that platform has existed in a really long time or if maybe ever so I was given that opportunity to become CEO, right? To actually think I could do this because there wasn't a rigidness in the four guys that I bought this company from to say it has to look exactly the way it's always looked. They were way ahead of their time in saying, we need really good leadership. And if it's going to show up with kids, we still want it in this company. And we'll open ourselves to what we think it looks like in order to get you to be able to do it. So I was able to really do both things. And then I look at it as what I need to do as a business owner is provide that to the other women that are out there. That's my task is how do you keep growing these platforms and allowing that person to be able to really grow in their career while still caring for their family. So that all touches on the topic of wanting to have a life in both arenas. And I think that's the coolest thing about our society right now is there used to be this thought process of I have to sacrifice one for the other. I may love doing this, but you know what? I, I would rather be with my kids and most people wouldn't argue with that. And so they'd say, well, of course, go be with your kids instead of, no, you can find a way to do both. And you may not be doing both at the exact same time, the exact same way. It's gonna, there's gonna be some balance struggles, you know, sometimes you're going to be over here at work and sometimes you're going to be over here at home, but you talk about um, adoption. You've mentioned that to me and I know you've mentioned that in other um, episodes. You also had mentioned in some of the, the content that I created here as we're doing, going through this interview is from a fabulous interview that was done by the Leaders and Legends podcast from the California Association of Realtors. And Sarah Sudachan was interviewing you in, in that in that interview. And one of the concepts that really came up during that was time management, of course, but you said in that interview that your children have impacted your career the most. And the I like the way that you had said this, and I wasn't a part of that interview. So I want to kind of dig into this and see if I caught a little nugget. You had said that you've learned to set incredible boundaries with them. And I took that to say it with boundaries with your kids, but then also at work. And I think there's an appropriate boundary on both. Like mom can do what she loves at work and that's okay. And mom can also be at home and be a rock star mom. And there is a place for both. And so can you give me a few examples of that where it's not only, hey, the kids are always going to be the priority because you've got a really big, important job and you've got people who trust in you on a daily basis. And if you're constantly saying, hey, look, I got to do the mom thing they're going to look and say, okay, look, we're here to make some business happen. So how do those boundaries look for you in some specific examples? Well, I think the first and foremost thing that I've done and that I've consistently done, and it is, it's a challenge to keep doing it, is to remember what is important day to day, right? It's not just that I put this years ago, I said this boundary existed and these standards existed, and then I didn't honor them. Every day you have to say, like, today I've got to stop right now. And this is up on the hierarchy. A couple of days ago, my son twisted his 
leg in Taekwondo and I was in the middle of a business meeting and I was like, hey, this is great. You know, I'll follow up with you again. I've enjoyed this one hour. I cannot go into hour two or it's like another half an hour. I've got to go. My son hurt himself, right? There's clearly at that moment, you know, what's most important. That's a little bit of a drastic measure, but what it comes down to is a lot of times if we don't have the confidence in our offering, right, either as a mother or as a business owner, right, as a broker, we start to sacrifice our own standard. So we feel obligated because maybe we weren't on point that day or we didn't get some product out or we flub something with an agent or whatever it may be. So then we end up feeling guilty. We take that late call and we start breaking our own standards. And one of the things I, I really find myself not doing and I actually really inspire my staff to do is to say, be very clear on your boundaries. Be very clear on your expectations. If you tell somebody you're going to get back to them at a certain time, get back to them at that certain time. And then they will trust in the fact that even if you are running to go deal with something with your kid or something has come up and it's a play you want to see, that if you say, I'll call you back 45 minutes later, or we'll deal with this tomorrow morning when I am available, I will be 100% available for you because I was 100% available at this time. And if you honor that and you show up for that, you start to create a culture around an expectation and a standard and everybody gets on board. I've had a lot of managers that will come in and say, how do you do this, right? How do you do this? How do you not take calls late at night when deals go, you know, sideways? And because ultimately nothing's really going to get solved at that time of night anyway. And I do need to sleep. But in the morning when I've gone to bed like other human beings and had a good night's sleep and I'm there, that problem will exist in the morning and I will get to it first thing. I will have your back, but I do not need my phone on my hip to show you that I can serve you. And I think so many of us are trying to constantly prove that value all the time without saying my value lies in the consistency of when I told you I would be there and then actually showing up and doing it. I talked with somebody earlier today and they were saying, you know, the big thing is in sales that you say you're going to be able to do something and it makes you a good sales agent if you can get a lot of clients. But really the best salespeople are the ones that just do what they said they're going to do. Those are the ones you would refer and you would pay top dollar for, and you would work for, or you would work with, or you would find time to wait in line to work with that person because they say they're going to do it. And, and that's, that's what I do is, hey, I might not be able to do it on tap. That's not the kind of manager I am, right? I'm not the chat box woman who's there answering at two o'clock. I'm not the one that's going to pick up every single call. I've got a lot of stuff going on so I can give you what I need to. I'm not always accessible, but when I am accessible, I am with you right? I am there. And then when we're having that conversation and I'm listening, I'm going to figure out on the back end what I need to do to service the people I work with. The same exact thing goes with my kids, right? They respect the fact I work at home. This is my kind of my home office, right? And a lot of times I'm here. And when that door is closed, and I will admittedly say sometimes they're really excited and they bust right in, but there is a line that is held with, hey, these are the work hours. And when I get to do the work during the work hours, they don't get to bleed into dinner. They don't get to bleed into that night. Occasionally, there's exceptions to the rule, but you've got to hold the standards on both ends. You can't just tell the kids one thing and then blow it on the back end, and you can't just tell the agents one thing and then blow it with the kids, right? They deserve equal respect. And then also, I deserve it. I deserve to be able to have that time where I know who I've got to engage with. So I've just been really clear on that, and I've been doing it. I, you know, I, I've been running this business, and uh, I've been an owner of this company since my son was a year old. So we've done it together. We've had to evolve. His needs have changed. The business's needs have changed. When I bought the company, it's grown a lot since then. My son's grown a lot since then too. So has my daughter, right? So we do this evolution together. And sometimes you got to flip it around a little bit. Sometimes they're going to need a little bit more than what they did. And sometimes the business is going to need a little bit more. But you give yourself, at least I do, permission to, to just grow, right? To, to pivot on either side. And it doesn't always have to be exactly the same. But when I tell my kids something, I really just try to follow up on it. And then, I mean, I really do my best. And the same thing with my agents is when I am there, I'm, I'm with you. And they respect it. Like they understand it. There's been a really nice exchange between us. Perfect segue to my next question, which is about burnout. I think you've said this, that, that no one can tell you when to stop working, especially when you love what you do. And I like to say when you love your craft and you remind us that you have to find your own reason for taking a break. So those boundaries exist, I think on both sides. 
And you've mentioned that sometimes you realize, hey, it's been too much. I just got to pack up the car with the kids and we're going somewhere for the weekend. So when do you know that it's time for you to recalibrate and cool your jets a little bit? Uh, what do you personally do to recharge outside of the office when you're feeling like it's just, it's been a pretty heavy week. I'm ready to just take the kids and go somewhere. Ha, huh. uh, well, yes. Usually what I try to do when I'm getting into a place where I feel burnout, it's usually, it's very funny because burnout usually occurs, we think it occurs externally, but I find that burnout occurs internally, right? It's that own mental chatter, it's that you're not sleeping well, it's those things where it's happening really to you, but you think it's happening out here. But it's sort of this self-control, and if you can get a control of a little bit of that stoicism inside and be like, whoa, I'm creating my own burnout, right? I actually have the ability to right now to say stop, I'm putting this aside, I'm done. I'm gonna get in the car and take the kids somewhere. I'm gonna go get in the car and I'm gonna drive somewhere. I'm gonna go take the dog for a walk. I find that a lot of times it's taking myself out of my reality. And it could be it could be a podcast, it could be a book, it could be a great Netflix series in which I'll like binge watch and then all of a sudden I'm out of this reality and I'm deep into you know some other reality and I'm starting to get excited and inspired again. Usually I know when I'm at burnout is when I'm not feeling inspired right? When I'm not feeling excited, like it's just a, it's just a weird sort of calibration that the battery just feels kind of low and I look fine and I talk fine. I remember what I'm doing, but I'm not really, I'm just not energized or inspired. And then it's just, no one really is going to get the best answer or get the best piece of me, or I'm not going to give the best of me if they get me at that point, right? Like nobody wants to leave the house with a battery at 20% right? You're like, oh man, this is going to die somewhere. I don't know where, but I'm going to need to use that phone and it's not going to work. I know right now it's already low, so plug it in. And it's like that for human beings. Like for me, I'm like, I'm at 20% right now. You know what? I'm going to take the night off. I'm going to take tomorrow off. Um, I'm huge about creating, and this is sort of like, I, I don't want to sound hippy dippy with manifestation, but I really believe um, in creating a space nearby that is outside of the day to day. So for me, you know, we've talked a little bit about this, but when I was 21 years old, I went up to Napa, California. And the day I got there, it was the first time I was there. And I was like, oh my God, there's a geographical place in this earth that I feel differently in. It just was awesome. And I said, I will be here one day. I will be in the space, but I cannot tell you that has been a place for me over the years with my husband that we've gone to forever. And it's an hour away. Thank God it was so close because if it had been like Tahiti, I'd be in trouble, <laughs> but it's nice and close. And what I've done over the years is to craft now a place that I can go to and wind down where I could be with family, right? Community is hugely important to me. That's why I care so much about the agents and my brand and my business, because I've created a community there that I'm deeply invested in, in a city that I'm deeply invested in. Well, the same thing happens when I need to take a break or when I'm having burnout is I've crafted a place that I can go to that is, that is beautiful for what it needs to me to get me inspired again. And when I can go to that place, whether it's with a book or just being quiet or with a glass of wine or with my kids or with my very close friends, my family, all I need is maybe a few hours of that. I don't need some grand trip or some, I just need a few hours of just remembering why I do it, who I am, what this is all about and having gratitude for that day and those people. And then that is like 15 minutes, I swear to God, it's like plugging it in and getting not only the phone charged again, but like a, an actual battery pack attached to it. And I can go again and I can do it longer. But that really does take a huge amount of self-awareness and confidence that it's okay to feel that way and to know that you've got to take care of yourself before other people have to take care of you. You know, one of the things in management and the biggest struggle I've seen for new managers is they're trying to do the job that they think the boss wants them to do and they're doing it in their pounding way. They don't want to show like, hey, I need a day off. I call them snow days. Hey, I need a snow day. I just need a day where it snowed and I didn't have to do anything and the power went out and I just like sat around and read a book and did nothing and nobody could do anything because the roads were shut down. We all were like, oh, just snow, just so I could get a snow day, not a sick day. Very different from a snow day. Is just how can I just turn it off? And I think that what we need to do is create a society or an environment that allows that. That actually says, oh my God, look at you honoring yourself. Look at you saying that today I need a little bit of a break, so I'll be better tomorrow, I'll be better next week. That to me is true leadership. And those are the people that I watch because they know that they've got the confidence to take care of themselves, to do the job that they're supposed to be doing. 
which may be parenting or it may be running a company, servicing agents, doing whatever it is. Like know your limits and then like plug into them so that you don't hit your limit. Like what they say, like take a break so that you don't have to quit, right? Like who's got, why do you got to quit? Just take a few snow days. So I think it's that. I think it's creating an environment. It's knowing what you like to do. I'm a super curious person. So I always have all these little things lined up. Like I have all these books on my nightstand that I want to read. And so when I need those times to just peel back a little bit and get excited and inspired, I've got all those things lined up for me, like little gifts, all ready to go and open. Like, I'm like, yay, I get to do this thing. I put it to the side for that day that I had burned out and I read this great book or I saw this great series or I got super inspired by a podcast, whatever it may be. And I line them up because I know that they, those days they come. They're there. I love your answer because it reminds me of so many things that I've heard in my own life. So we'll go down them uh, real quickly here. So famous author and marketing guru, Seth Godin, had admitted at one point that he was feeling extremely discouraged. And if you've ever seen Seth speak or read any of his works, you're like, how's that guy ever have a bad day? It just feels like he's got constant thought process and curiosity and just concepts just oozing out of him. But he said that he actually had to listen to several book series um, on, on an audible to basically reprogram his mind and put another voice in his head. Yeah. So that's the, the first thing I think of. Second thing is my mother-in-law. So my wife, Courtney, and her brother, Brandon, they would famously take what they called, and this is 25 years ago, mental health days. They would literally just, mom would be like, we're taking a mental health day, call in sick. Uh, Lee was a, a stay-at-home mom. And she would say, Brandon, Courtney, we're just going to hang out around the house or whatever. You don't wasn't they were they weren't actually sick sick they were just feeling like they needed a little bit of a recharge so think about that and then the other part is i mentioned here that we're broadcasting at at 8369 feet in grand lake grand lake for me is is your napa and my wife courtney has said this the reason why we're buying a property here and and we're we're taping this on a tuesday tomorrow i'm in i'm in the title company today that will be closing in tomorrow and this has been my dream for 20 years it's been courtney's dream that we have a place in the mountains and we visited so many different places vale and beaver creek and we've gone to glenwood springs and uh, we you know spent some time up in Laramie, Wyoming, and gone to all these different mountain places and had all these different experiences. Um, and and what happens is you you kind of say, okay, we've experienced all these places. Now, where do we want to actually have a place? And we love Grand Lake because it's got water and it's got mountains. You've got summer and you've got winter, and it's just my happy place. And and I love that you describe it that way because it is totally in that moment where you're feeling uninspired, you're feeling a little checked out. You are Robo Vanessa or Robo Kyle, and you're feeling like I'm just going through the motions. And what you do need is you need to just kind of change your environment just for a day or two, or maybe a weekend, and and just have that little mental reset. I think that that's perfect. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about because I think it's it's apropos is that you have mentioned in some of your podcasts that you've got this crayons concept that I think that you got from your mother. And it's, I want you to describe it, and I think it's perfect, but I, I love that concept of, of this crayons concept and also hive learning. So as you talk about cultivating, you've got this curious mind, but then you've also, you're, you're taking information from several different sources for your own inspiration. Let's talk about hive learning and your mom's concept of crayons. Crayons, okay. So my mom used to, the funny thing is about it is, my mom is a huge analogy person. She was my entire life and she was a stay-at-home mom. And I always tell her, you were a stay-at-home mom, but you actually run a business in the future because ultimately most of the lessons I've learned in what I've done and, and how I've built my company were really taught for me by my mother. My dad was also a, a, an entrepreneur, owned his own company. So he kind of was the strategy and the, you know, there, there was an influence for both of them, but, but she would also talk about this thing where she would tell me when I was young, you know, about sometimes you don't always just color with one crayon. And this was about like whether you broke up with somebody or you had friends that you didn't want to see and there was like how you tired out it was, you know, you don't always use the same color crayon, even if you love blue, right? And it's your favorite color and you find yourself crayon coloring with that all the time. Sometimes you are going to need to switch to that red crayon. That's why they give you a whole box of colors because 
all these different people or a different color crayon and you need to add them to that overall portrait of whatever is your life for your day or your narrative at that time. And even though blue might be your favorite, sometimes you gotta add red or you gotta add yellow. And those are the different personalities. And what, what's interesting about even how kind of crayons interject with or intercept with uh, hive learning is in order to have the hive, right? To have the whole thing, you have got to have people that look at things differently. You cannot just have one way of thinking, one strata of, you know, of anything, of, what, of, of, of income, of, of the way somebody looks, right? Their ethnicity, their, um, whether they're male or female, what age they are. There's something about having all those differences in on the collective that creates a new opinion around things. And all of them matter and they influence the outcome if there's more variety. Otherwise, it's just everyone's just doing shades of blue, right? And in our company, and it's interesting, I never called it the hive, but the agents started calling it the hive. And all of a sudden, we would get these emails of, hey, hive, hey, hive, I want to check with the hive. And then all of a sudden, it's become the, ling the, like the lingo within the company of, they don't just go to management and say, let's go ask the managers, or let's go check the policy guide, or let's go, like, like, they go to the hive, they go to the collective and say, what would you do? And what the most beautiful thing is when you own a company or when you look at something that you've curated, I didn't create it, right? This company exists, this culture existed, but now I've curated, I've gone out and found who should be parts of this and I just add them. I add them, I don't expect them to do a certain thing. I don't say that these are our rules and these are our standards because you don't need to when you align with the right people. You just get them, they come into the, they come into the ecosystem and then you let them do their thing. And then they collaborate in this way. And when you look out at that, to me, success is to look out at how they help each other in one of the most competitive industries in the world and how they move as a collective. And that is success, that you put a group of people together that when they do this, they are not only helping each other, but they are helping their clients. And when they help their clients, that helps the community. So it becomes this way bigger. When you look from it up here, it's like way bigger than just, oh, I run a company with 100 people. No, what I'm doing here and what happens down here is showing up in the community, right? And then if that's bad, I need to take ownership of if it doesn't look good. But if it's great, I sort of, I sort of you know, sit there and take it all in and soak it in on this is something that's really great. And these are different individuals that each bring a little piece of honey to that hive and they all sort of live in it together. And that's, and that, truly is what, you know, that, that we talk about culture and that cliche word about culture, but that's what a culture is. That's what it is. And it could be exclusionary. It could be, there's all different types, but you can create that. You do have to create a standard within it and you do have to hire to it. If you hire incorrectly, it will show up instantly, right? And then you, and then if you made that wrong move, now, as a leader of that company, you have got to go in there and fix that, right? Because if you let it go, then you will cannibalize what you built. You cannibalize your own culture. And I think that is one of the things that the, the hive, um, then it becomes this sort of bigger thing on its own. And it's not up for me to power it along, right? It does it individually. They all come as a collective and they power it along. And that, that is, I think, when I look it out is what makes a beautiful company, a beautiful organization. Well, it's a perfect, perfect answer. And a good thing, I think, to just add to that is that one of the best coaches that I have ever had an, uh, an opportunity to meet with and share ideas with and listen to and just kind of one of these people you kind of sit at the footstool and just soak it all in said that everybody in your organization is a culture ambassador. And when they, when they say, oh, this is a big pain or this is, this is a big problem, their response to it is, then fix it. And, and I like to say this to my own kids, be a part of the solution. There's a problem here. This is not, you know, it's not the leader's job to set the culture. Every single person sets the culture. And culture is a cliched word. And, and that was something that you just said. It, it, I completely agree. And, and I think that a lot of people say, oh, like culture, 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 and don't really know what it really means. A culture is not good or bad. It can be good or bad, but the word itself is just very, um, it's very neutral. 
and it just simply is the the collective beliefs of people within some group whether it's a society or a company or a community so it's just what they believe we do things this way well why do you do it that's just our culture right. and and so i think that everybody strives to have a good culture but not every culture is a good one and it is cliche and i agree with you it can be hard to define you really need to just live and feel it to actually experience it so you had mentioned a couple of these concepts where agents in a competitive environment are taking up for each other and really still having this community, which is, which is beautiful to see and experience. So when everything's clicking for you at Red Oak, how does good culture look? Like what are some real concrete examples of these are the things that we've just seen. We didn't think it was a big deal on the inside, but on the outside, people are saying this is so rare and it's such a special thing. What are some of the things that Red Oak is just known for, for folks that aren't as familiar with your company based in Oakland and Berkeley? So a couple of things. I think, you know, when you have a good culture, almost whatever is happening externally, or even if something happened internally, it doesn't just fall apart, right? It's stronger than that. It doesn't just all of a sudden a new model moved into town and everyone goes, or um, there's a, a commission rate reduction and everyone follows it. Like they believe in what has been built. So it's not something that one tiny issue or one bad thing happening can make the whole thing fall apart. Um, years ago, we had some issues with partnerships that, that could have basically broken a company. And I found out really what my culture was about when every single person within the company found out that there had been some problems at, at our leadership level and stuck by it and stuck in it and helped each other out and helped me out. And it wasn't this external pressure. They rather gathered around me rather than spread out and apart. The same thing has happened once you know my um, managing broker on his way to work about almost a, a little over a year and a half ago, had a heart attack and passed away suddenly on his way into work one day. And he was a huge, he was the heart of our company. He was the brain, he was really truly the brain. I mean, he was, he was empathetic and knowledgeable and calm and wonderful. And suddenly overnight, he was gone. And, and we had a big gap. And there was a, there was a, a, a gap in the, in, the, in the sort of, he was missing as a person from this earth. But then there was also this gap in what he offered logistically to the workings of the company. There was a hole there and it, and it wasn't something you could fill overnight. And amazingly so, the agents, once again, they started helping each other and his name was Art and they would say, what would Art do? What would Art do? And they would gather around and they would end up helping each other with the answers around that by channeling what he would do. They didn't say, Vanessa, we've got to find somebody right now. Our needs aren't being met or we miss a heart, or we, all of a sudden they started thinking like him and there became this new language that went around and they all stepped in and they helped each other. When I was out looking for new management, when I was trying to pick up the pieces of that experience, they all just got together and had each other's backs. People that were not managers stepped in and helped each other on transactions. It was amazing to see. So, you know, how do you create that culture? It's, it's nothing you could just create that day. It's something you've built in a standard that you've held long before it ever gets tested. You see what it is. You see the reality of it when it gets tested in an issue like that, that something like that in life happens. And then you're like, that, that's what I'm trying to explain what culture is, but I can't put it into words. That's what it looks like. And that experience has happened time and time and time again. So, but what the other thing is, is I think it's also having gratitude for that culture, like gratitude for the people that exist and letting them be themselves and honoring that. One of the things that I do that's kind of different as a, as a, as a company owner is people come to my house a lot, they're in my home, um, we do our events together. And one of the interesting things is everyone says, wow, you know, Red Oak has like kind of a party culture. Like you see people out, like you throw big events. And, and I always think that sometimes people get confused that like a happy hour creates a culture. I think a celebration and the ability to want to be together to celebrate shows a, an element of what a culture is, but it doesn't mean doing a happy hour a week and picking up the bar tab because these are the same people that celebrate together, but they also do very professional business together, right? We're not a company that's like, oh, we're always out, you know, partying and having a good time, but we don't do the job. We do the work. 
We're a successful company. We close a lot of transactions. We do it in a very specific way. We're, we're a top company in the area, but we also play together, right? We mourn together, we celebrate together, and we can compete in a way that there's good competition, but we can compete and support each other. I don't even know really truly if someone said one day, like, how did you do all that? How did it happen? I'm not sure I could blueprint it out and see like, here's the business plan, building a great culture. But there's things that you do along the way and there's those little standards of when you realize it might be going away or that it's being compromised, that you've got to go in and you've got to make sure you pay attention to that one little tiny crack that can create a bigger crack and take the whole thing down. And that is, that's when you truly honor a good culture. And I think that's probably what I do is, it's not, it's not always like you built it and therefore it will just continue to exist. It's constant management of that, constantly going back and touching it. That is fascinating. And what a touching story about Art. Um, we didn't prepare for that. I think it's a, a wonderful tribute to him in the way that you describe him. And also as a leader, probably a really scary moment, I'm assuming. I mean, obviously you lose a friend, just think of it from that level, you're gripping with that, you're mourning, you're mourning together. But then you're like, I have all these agents that have some expectations and appropriately so, right? I mean, it's great that they took up for each other and, and did all that and you're like, this is amazing. But at the same time, you want to also find a way that the company doesn't shut down because art is gone. And, and, and such a, I would imagine such a um, paradox of we're missing him, but we want to make sure that we can prove that we can also move on and how do you do that? And, and just like any, any loss of anybody important, what an incredible uh, answer and example, but um, just really a testament to what um, the folks at Red Oak are doing. And what a cool, cool situation and a way of honoring him. Yeah, they were great. They were great folks and they gave me the time and the space in which I said both to heal and mourn, but also to find some person that could replace him, right? And they, there's never gonna be replacing him because he was a time and a person and a period in which we moved, but his values and his core and some of the things he built will always be there in a company. He left a legacy and that is something honored. And you know, one quick thing, and I know this isn't a question you asked, but I think it's no, one it's okay. answer. It's that. Someone said, what are you most proud of in, in, in building in Red Oak? And what I'm most proud of is that I was somehow, I don't know, smart or empathetic enough to realize that what happened when these guys started this company in a garage in 1976, you know, a long time ago, that when I came in, I realized that that had value, right? That had credibility. And although the company, we still have, you know, that office, but although it looks different, the brand's different, the collateral's different, the people have been added on, um, we, everything sort of got, you know, maybe more modernized, obviously from the seventies, but the core thing that they built and the way they built it that day, absolutely 100% exists today. I kept that. It was like keeping like a diamond and then building around it. It didn't get thrown out with being like, I'm the new modern leader and I'm a woman and I'm a fresh faced and this is the way we're going to take it. That's not it. It was this thing and made it for a long time and it needed to evolve in the way it looked on the street. So we had to take that thing and then actually say, here's what exists, but it needs to get to the street. It needs to be able to, you need to be able to pick up uh, uh, you know, a brochure or meet an agent at an open house or close a transaction at a title company or walk in the office. And that has to, that thing that exists has to be fluid and be obvious and tangible and all that different collateral. The building, the person, the collateral, the sign, the bench all of it. And I think that was what I did. I just saw the gift of what attracted me to Red Oak. And I try to keep that alive for whoever or wherever this goes next, is that that maybe goes onto a bigger platform and reaches out in a bigger way. But I honored what existed. And I think a lot of times when a company is started, we either mimic something that already exists that we don't actually have. And that's not our true value. That's not really our, where it, where it is. Or we get rid of something thinking, oh, that's old and that's dated, right? But, you know, integrity and ethics and a value conscious brand probably existed in the caveman days and probably will exist moving forward. Those things will always matter. They may look more modernized. They may have a different face on them, 
But that is a core central piece of every business. And when you look around right now in capitalism, it's like everything goes, right? Anything goes because this is what you need in order to succeed. You got to be ruthless. You got to be this because we're talking about capitalism. I'm sorry. It's just business. It's just business. And I just don't buy that. I believe that there is something that people are looking for within a business that is more important than it's just being business. So it's felt like we should mention that. Well, it, it's a perfect answer to a question we were planning on asking. And, and I, I think that, I think that you talk about there's, there's obviously distinct advantages of stepping into a company that already existed. You have the ability to foster along a culture that was there long before you. And then you also have the um, disadvantage at times. So there's advantages, of course, but there's disadvantages in that there's already people there that already have expectations and you're stepping into a group and you're going to innovate in, in certain ways with a group of people that have already existed. And so I think you've done a very good job of tangoing in that dance of making sure that you sprinkle in some of the new while keeping appropriately some of the, some of the old. And I, I think that's very, very important. I, I think that a lot of people get lost in that. And I completely agree with you, by the way. Amen, sister, about the whole concept of this is just business or, you know, check your feelings at the door. All of that's a bunch of crap. I, mean, I, I have had so many circumstances where people have said, hey, look, don't get offended. This is just business. We're hiring someone else. Don't get offended. We're going somewhere else. And you know what? It, it is offensive. And you know what? I put my blood, sweat, and tears into this, whatever it is, a listing, a client relationship, a business. Yes, I'm offended. And it's okay for me to be offended. And I'm okay if you feel a little uncomfortable by the fact that my feelings are hurt. Now, I'm going to be professional and I'm not going to, you know, go off the handle off on, on someone. But, you know, the, the idea that you're going to desensitize the situation, which is clearly raw, is, compl is a complete insult. And I, I love that you said it. I love that you said that that is there's no place in that idea that capitalism is this cold and prickly. There's, there's no feelings or sensitivity. We're, we're people and we're humans. And the idea that things existed when the cavemen existed, we are tribal. We are cultural. People need community. And the idea that everybody can just be bopping in and out of all these offices that have no personality and you can plug into one office in Pittsburgh and plug into another office in Baltimore and all of a sudden everything's the same. I just don't buy it. And I think it's really cool what you're doing at Red Oak to, to make sure that you really feel and embrace that. I think it's very cool. So a um, couple of other things. You'd mentioned some challenges. Obviously, art passing away is a challenge. Um, being, um, becoming a CEO as a female, but just also at a young age. Uh, we'll talk about both of those things. Challenges. And I've heard you talk about this in the past, that if you meet a woman CEO, she has faced some adversity to get to that position. So this concept of leveling up, you had mentioned in, in some of your past interviews that when you have challenges in life and you overcome those challenges, all they do, all those challenges do is set you up for the next bigger challenge. So how have you learned to be at peace while facing those challenges. I find that as a, as a young leader, as a young owner, I find that to be a very interesting dance, uh, to use that analogy again, being at peace while also facing something that's a big deal. So, so this is where I'm gonna actually, I get this piece of advice. I know that you um, were just bringing up Seth Godin, right? And so I don't know if you've ever heard, and I don't remember if I've mentioned this before, but I've talked about it, but I find it this fascinating way to deal with, you know, challenges are often something that happens where, you know, we're, are somewhat based in fear, right? Fear about making a decision or fear that the response is fear to something disrupting the status quo, right? It could be anything. Um, it could be very little and it could be very huge. And I've seen them on both ends of the spectrum. I've had huge challenges and I've had little ones that actually kind of sneak up on you, like a little microbe. And then the next thing you know, you're like, whoa, on your back really down with that challenge. But one of the things um, that I'm a huge, I, that I love, I love the concept of, uh, and I listen to a little, I get his newsletter and I listen to him all the time and is Tim Ferriss. And he talks about fear setting. And I don't know if you've heard of this concept. Everyone talks about goal setting and goal setting is, you know, you always got to figure out when you're working with people, are they motivated by reward or are they motivated sometimes by fear? And some people could be really inspired by loss of 
and that is an inspirational thing to get them moving. And then there's some that are really inspired by gaining something. And everybody works from usually one of those places. Um, for me, goal setting has always been sort of this interesting thing. And I, I, but fear setting is something that whenever I'm facing a challenge or something that I wasn't planning for and has popped up and there's no running from it is how do I take it on? I do fear setting, right? You look at this thing and you say, what is the worst thing that can happen? Why is this a challenge? What is it that is getting to me? You're getting to the concept of unsettlement for me. And you take that and you put it up there and you own it and you say, this is it. This is what I'm most afraid of. And then you work backwards. Okay, so let's start there. If the worst thing possible happens, what are all the things that are going to happen because of that? And you go through the list. I could do this and this could happen and this can happen and this can happen. And then you say, okay, so let's go through those 20, 10 to 20 things that could happen. And now let's go through each one of them. If that happens, what's your plan B? Okay, if this happens, what's your plan B? And what you do is you start to tackle bit by bit with a blueprint, the worst thing imaginable. And you put a plan into place for each one of them happening so that you feel more prepared to take on the ultimate challenge. And it's such a brilliant way to start realizing that almost the 80%, sometimes even more of what you wrote down is highly unlikely to all happen, especially at once, right? And then you kind of whittle away, but if this happens, there is this plan. And then sometimes within that greatest fear becomes the answer to the challenge. Right there on the little yellow pad of paper. I keep them by me all the time just to notes. And, and I do this, I try to do it as often as possible. I haven't been doing it lately, um, but it is something that I feel is a really good technique to take on those challenges. And then as a business owner, I remember my first coach said to me, I said, when do I ever get to put my feet up as a business owner? Like, when do I get to be like those people in like Falcon Crest or something where they're like just sitting out on like a yacht with a cocktail and it's all easy and there's a bunch of people handling it. And she's like, oh, oh my God, I'm so sorry that you bought the company thinking that'll ever happen. You'll never put your feet up. Um, so I accepted that early on. This isn't a bad, I didn't do this to put my feet up. I did this because ultimately deep down, I really love those challenges. I really love being able to curate the hive, right? Those things to me are so much greater than any of my challenges. So I realized early on, when you get that challenge, when you make it through, then the next time you get one, you have a record, right? You've got a portfolio of challenges that you've already seen there, done that, been there. And you realize that one of the little lessons in that one is actually needing to be applied right now. So it becomes this book of basically all the things you've already taken on. And then you start to be, you go from like the new novice beginning business owner to someone who actually now has experience and failure, right? And you realize, oh, I'm still standing. I'm still standing. I have had one thing that I thought would knock me out. And not only did it not knock me out, I'm thriving. So all I get that, that concept of leveling up is when you do make it through that challenge of which you will, if you can get that mental chatter together in your own head, you'll make it through. You'll make the right decision. If you make the wrong decision, You'll realign and figure out the next right decision from there. And then you get ready because it's never, ever like, oh, smooth sailing, islands ahead, sunshine, margaritas all day long. You did it, challenges are over. Like that's actually called death. <laughs> and I'm not really, I'm ready to keep on going with this and figuring that out later on. Uh, so, you know, part of it's gotta be that you're willing to take those on. And I think, I do think that leadership when you really have got leadership qualities in you and you want those challenges, sometimes you even create your own just to get things going again. Um, so every time I've had them, I realize this is the last one and whatever decision I make is not etched in stone, right? You can change your mind, you can pivot, you can call whatever term you want. And then when you get through that and it's smooth sailing again, there is something right around the corner and you start to be able to talk yourself down a little bit from, the anxiety of, oh no, it's happening again. Of course it's happening again. It's called life, right? So I mean, that's sort of the, the short answer to it. I, I love it. Tim Ferriss has been such a great thought leader and oh, influencer. Another uh, thought leader that I am really allowing to kind of influence my uh, thought process of success is a guy named Ed Milet from California and Ed Milet on his last podcast, literally this week, I was listening to it yesterday as I was on a run, was talking about um, high achievement and that the two things that people generally get wrong is that if you look at high achievement and you distill it down to what 
got you there. It's generally two things. It's, it's hunger as one and focus as the other. And he said, typically what happens, and, and you just touched on this, is that good is the enemy of great, right? There's new levels, new devils, another cliche to use. So Ed had shared, he's like, if you feel like you've accomplished something, if you feel like you're a champion fighter, be careful because there's a next contender, there's the challenger, and oftentimes the challenger in a boxing match or UFC or whatever it is beats the champion. The challenger beats the champion because the challenger is hungry. The challenger has desperation. And sometimes that fear is desperation in you that's saying, I'm now leveling up and it's scary, but it should motivate you. Mm -hmm. And so what it takes though also is focus because if you become determined, if you want something so bad, it's all you can think about, it ends up being, it becomes so obsessive. And I hate to use that word, but becomes an obsession that you then end up accomplishing it. And, and oftentimes the other issue with high achievers is you achieve at so many things, you have all these opportunities that get thrown at you. And so what ends up occurring is as you're leveling up, you're like, I'm at this new level and I've got all these new great friends with all these new ideas and all these business pitches and all these things that are being thrown at me. And you forget what it was that got you there in the first place. Uh -huh. And so that was just a fascinating podcast episode by Ed Milet. Um, I, I love this conversation. And I always, at the end, I always hate that they have to be, that they have to be over. But I think it's worth mentioning that as we talk about leveling up. So this podcast started off very humbly. My business that I started two years ago, Calibrate Real Estate, started very humbly. And there are people that helped me get there. I will share that this interview was never supposed to happen. And the reason why it was never supposed to happen for people that don't know is I've never met Vanessa before. I hope we'll meet at some point, but I was connected to you by Stephanie Lanier first and then Raj Kassar. Both have been podcast guests. Stephanie was connected to me by Brad Allen from Columbia, South Carolina. Brad and I were 30 under 30 honorees in different years for Realtor Magazine. So if you think about it, there are all these dots that get connected. And the only way, the lesson in that, and I didn't plan on sharing this, but it is apropos, it's how I book my podcast guests. I always ask at the end of every podcast, who do you know that I should know? And what ends up happening is as I'm leveling this podcast up and getting yeah. better guests, people who have accomplished things, people that are from all over the US, and I've had people ask me, they're like, you're from Denver, like, how are you talking to all these people from Texas and California and South Carolina? Like, where does this all come from? I just simply ask and I get connected to amazing people. And the reason I do this podcast is so that I can become a better leader. The, the number one priority is that I can learn. And then I sit there and say, well, it, that's pretty selfish because if you do a coffee appointment or you do a lunch appointment, which we all do, we all have these amazing experience one-on-one -on -one with someone who is at the next level or maybe two or three levels above that we want to be at, right? And I, I just said to myself, I'm like, to heck with that. I'm going to share this with the world because I've got the ability to communicate with some people and someone that's in New York may not know either of us, but they can benefit themselves by being a better salesperson or a better husband or a better wife or better brother, friend, sister, whatever it is, because they hear two people that are excelling at life and, and they, they understand that they're not perfect, but they also realize that there's some methodology to the way that they're successful. So um, all that to say that this is, this is a really, really cool conversation. I hate that it's ending, but I do have one last question. Everybody who's listened to my podcast know I always save this question for the end. We've touched on this answer a little bit, but I'll ask it very, very specifically. So the question is, dear younger me, you're writing a letter to yourself. It's the advice you wish you knew when you were 22. So what would you say to the 22-year-old Vanessa? I know that was just a year ago, Vanessa, but it's the 22-year-old version of Vanessa, what would you say to her? And then what do you say to 22-year-olds that you interact with today, whether they're in your company or you just have a niece or a nephew or, or whoever it is that's in their early 20s? What's the advice that you give to folks in their 20s? Hmm, that's interesting. I have not hung out with a 22 year old in quite some time. Um, I think funnily enough, I would say at my 22 year old self, I was way almost more serious than I am today. And I know that's like, but I was, I was, I was a criminal justice major and I was looking at going into the FBI and that's a whole other podcast. But, um, 
I was so incredibly serious and I was dealing with a very dark world. And I guess the funny thing that I would say right now is keep doing what you did then because at 22, I actually was more on point than some things that I think that I am at 40 going on 45. There was stuff I did back then, maybe do a little bit more research and stay up even a little bit later because some of the stuff I did then is showing up so much more now. And I'm so glad that she did what she did then. And I'm really glad that she went and she traveled and she picked up and she took adventures because right now, that's not what my life is about. But all of that stuff made me confident. All the risk-taking behavior made me very confident about doing it right now. So I wouldn't even tell her, like, lighten up. I would say, like, yeah, get maybe get even a little bit more serious because that's kind of paid off. Um, I actually don't think I would have undone anything that I did, and I'm so really glad I did it. And that's not in any sort of arrogant way. I just actually remember who I was then, and I, 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 I'm so glad I did what I did. Um, for 22-year-olds right now, I'd say that you have permission to change your mind. I think sometimes we want to stay on this track. You know, that, that, that college thing that happened the other day, that with, you know, the cheating and the parents and all that stuff. I'm like, who puts it all on the line for something like college? Because there's a whole world in there to educate yourself and it's not about the receipt. And it's about what you learned and what you did, not the little piece of paper that has that I was at that concert and I was there and I did it. So I think this whole thing about like, enjoy the curiosity and the learning process and enjoy it in your 20s, right? That is probably the ripest time for just living your life and having fun and taking adventures. Because what you do at that time, good, bad, ugly, whatever, is all gonna sort of come to fruition later on in life. Um, I think those are the ripe years. And I think you should spend them, whether it's at college or your gap year or an adventure, like go have those things because they'll develop the mom, the business owner, the father, the friend, the parent one day that you are you're a lot younger than me, but in our years, right? In those ages. I think that sometimes I can still connect very closely with that 22-year-old backpacker in me. Um, so that's, I think, what I'd say. That spirit of adventure is really important. And I, I appreciate that you brought up the recent college scandal of parents basically being snowplow parents. I'm up in the mountains and snowplows are all over the place, but clear in the way for their kids that, that really don't, you know, haven't earned it, haven't deserved it. And uh, I'm, I'm glad I did this. I don't, I'm pretty casual today. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm wearing a ball cap and I'm wearing a flannel shirt and I'm in like mountain mode. I'm in happy place mode. And, but the hat that I'm wearing is the university of Wyoming's mascot. And it's the bucking Bronco with the cowboy on top. And for those that don't know my story very well, and it's not about my story, but it's a good uh, accentuator for your answer is that I got kicked out of college. I went to university of Wyoming. I got kicked out twice and graduated in four years. And I did that because I learned a very valuable lesson about uh, being serious and being intense and that you can't make your freshman year a gap year and stay in college. I mean, that's basically what I did. Some people go backpacking. Some people work in the Peace Corps. Some people go on a mission trip. All are, are great things. I went to college and wasted my parents' money for a year and they said enough and appropriately so. And the college said enough, you're out of here. My now wife transferred my sophomore year and she's like, you got to clean things up. And it took a full semester before it did. And I went st straight and narrow from there and was still able to graduate. And that moment was a real defining moment for me as I imagined backpacking and in traveling and criminal justice and seeing some of the dark parts of, of, of society are defining moments for us. And so I think it's a great answer, a great way to end our show. Vanessa Bergmark, this has been phenomenal. I have to say thank you to Raj Kassar and to Stephanie Lanier for connecting us. Um, it, 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 this is just such a cool community that realtors have across the US and really across the world. So I just appreciate their willingness to introduce us. It's been really, really cool. So for uh, my guest, Vanessa Bergmark, for our podcast producer, Kayla Davis. I'm Kyle Malnati. This is the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. If you loved this interview, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We're also 
on we're sp we're simulcast excuse me on spotify and youtube and as i love to say we will see you around the neighborhood thanks everybody see you later thanks, thanks. vanessa thank you